Students, may I have your attention up here, please? I'm going to begin today by removing my left shoe. I hope that doesn't nauseate anyone. I suppose in some way I'm doing this to honor the late, great Mr. Rogers. Putting on my tennis shoe, and I'm going to lace up the strings. And you know what, students, if you put enough string together, you end up with rope. rope. Rope comes in all different sizes and colors. Here we have yellow, and here it's multicolored. I think this is pretty fun, pretty funky. <laughs> Some nice colors going on there. And I even have rope that those who were accused of crimes in 1692 in a place called Salem, Massachusetts would be deathly afraid of. Ready for this? Yeah. <laughs> but don't worry, we are not going to use this in class, I promise. So we'll just put that away. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the sequential nature of things. We're going to put items in chronological order. We're going to take events and put them in a list from what we think is the greatest to the least important. We're going to use rope for displays. We're going to make math come alive through the use of rope. Today's active learning strategy is entitled Learning the Ropes. Are you ready to give it a try? Yeah. Let's do this. So I have two hat rack students, and I attach some rope to that end, and I'm going to tie a pretzel knot on this end. And I'm using a pretzel knot because that's the only knot I know how to make. <laughs> and I'm going to tighten it up. And now if you look up here, I have some wooden clothespins. I've got some colorful plastic ones. And I have a clothespin on steroids. <laughs> We're going to use these clothespins to hang up some signs that are going to put events into a certain order. Do you understand how that works? Mm -hmm. And we can do this for math and science and integrated language arts, and history and geography, and really any content area. So we'll try it with a number of different items. Let's do it. And now the friendly competition is about to begin. I'm going to break you into three cooperative groups. Each group is going to get a set of signs like this. I'm going to shuffle them up. These are the eight steps needed to make banana bread. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. And you have to work cooperatively and put these in the correct order. And you're going to do it when I call you up on this rope right here. You think you can do it? Yeah. I know you can. You had a moment to review your notes. I want you to close your notebooks, please. And I'm going to give you a set of signs. Talk to each other. Put those in the proper order. From the beginning to the final step. Eight total. Go for it. All right, I want you to put away your notes. Here's your set of signs. And just shuffle through. Try to figure out the order from the first to the last step. Okay. Here we go, students. Your notebooks are shut. I have taken the signs away from you. And we're going to engage in a little friendly competition. You ready for that? Yeah. All right, I'm going to start with Kokia's group. These are all shuffled up. You have to come up here. You have to discuss with one another and put these in proper order. First step to the final step for making banana bread. And you might have noticed I am wearing a stopwatch. 
you're going to be timed. I'll let you know how long it took and what mistakes you made when you're finished. You ready? Yeah. yeah. Come on up. Wish them good luck, everyone. Good luck. Ready? Go. seconds and I'm going to check real quick you have one mistake let's give a little something on that that's pretty good go ahead and take them off please and you can have a seat the next group that's going to come up is Emily's group Shuffle them. Class, let's wish you good luck. You ready? Talk to one another. And go. Correct. Nice job. Nice job. I need you to take them down, please. You know what you have to do? Yeah. You got to have them in the proper order, and you have to be 36.01 seconds. Can you do it? Yeah. All right. We'll see. Thank you. I'm gonna shuffle these up. See if they're in the proper order, and then I'll tell you how much time it took. Nope. You have them in the correct order, and the time that it took you was 41.63 seconds. And that's okay. I want everybody to give yourselves a little something, something for a job well done. Excellent. My friendly competitors, if I may have your eyes and more importantly your nostrils up here, I would appreciate it. 
If you notice, I've got some bread. I wish I could tell you it's banana bread. It isn't, but it's still bread. And I've got some yummy butter. Yummy. And I'm going to butter a piece of bread for the group that won. How does that sound, the main group? Yeah, yeah. sure. Is. But because we want to keep it friendly, I'm also going to make sure that all of you get a piece of buttered bread for today's active learning strategy. Sound good? Yeah! All right, you're first, so come on up. Learning the ropes is truly an interactive, memorable, and fun experience. Students love working cooperatively and more importantly, when you feel it's appropriate, competitively. Now imagine requiring your students to put the steps of the scientific method into the appropriate sequence. Problem, hypothesis, experiment, observations, conclusions. How about the events leading up to the American Revolutionary War? What about mathematical equations and formulas? How about the order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction? You could ask the students to place the events from your favorite classroom novel into the correct order. Chronological, sequential, reverse order, alphabetical order, the possibilities, as with so many of these active strategies, are truly limitless. Here are a few more examples. Please note, I may even reward the winning groups with an inexpensive piece of candy, a pencil, or in the case of this example, a slice of buttered bread. Exploring the cell cycle. Let's see how you do in terms of cell division. Matthew, your group is up. Good luck. Okay, so um, interface will be first. Let's try this now related to our study of American history. If you open your textbooks to page 155, they have a nice chart there and it gives information about events leading up to the American Revolutionary War. Boycotts, the Proclamation of 1763, the Stamp Act, etc. I'm going to give you a few minutes to study the chart. You're going to discuss it in your cooperative groups, and then you're going to come up here and put these in chronological order. You understand what to do? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's do it. Cooperative groups may study together with their books, notes, or handouts before placing the signs on the rope. Each cooperative group might have its own rope, and they could gracefully race against one another. When using lecture or large group discussion, begin by alerting your students that, at the end of the lesson, you will be choosing three students randomly from the entire class to put a list of events in order. You will certainly notice an increase in note-taking and participation. I sometimes race against a small group or even just one of my students. This is an exciting method for engaging specific individuals that may not always feel challenged. Incidentally, they end up beating me a lot. In a friendly manner, the other students cheer loudly against me. It is difficult, even for reluctant students, not to find this strategy entertaining and worthwhile. One technique I have used is to place several signs on the rope while I hold one specific sign in my hands. I ask the student where I should place the sign on the rope. I usually will get at least that much participation. If not, I still place reluctant students in cooperative groups and I still encourage them verbally. I am always hopeful the next time we use an active learning strategy, all students will want to take part. Here are a few more examples of using rope within your curriculum. Even something as simple as displaying student work is made easier and more exciting through the use of rope. Students enjoy hanging their projects with clothespins and I enjoy having my students up and about as we learn together.
Students, I have a very large red rope here. <laughs> That's right. And we're going to use it related to our study of math. Emily, I'm going to have you grab onto the end. I want the rest of you to come around and space yourselves out evenly. Go ahead. We're going to keep the circle. Excellent. Grab on. Okay, let's tighten up the circle a little bit. Please. Good. And lift the rope up. Not too far. Perfect. Now, Emily, I'm going to have you hang on to this part right here. Now, what is this called? The distance around. It's known as the circumference. Right. Now, if I go across this way, can you hold on to that, please? Molly, both of them. Raise your hand if you can tell me what the distance across the circle is called. Who knows? Lauren? Diameter. This is called a diameter. Excellent. What if I shorten it up? What is this distance that takes us to the center of the circle known as? Raise your hand if you know. Should we? The radius. The radius. Correct. Can anybody in here tell me what pi is? Angela. 3.14. And how do you measure... They say there's no such thing as a dumb question. Well, this may be true, but I do tell my students one question which certainly is not the most intelligent thing you can ask me as you turn in a homework assignment, project, or submit your completed notes would be, is this good enough? I tell them to be extraordinary. And I remind them, as we all know, the only difference between ordinary and extraordinary is the little extra. I even write the word ordinary on the board with white chalk, and then I add the word extra right in front in big red letters. I explain to my students, I do not want them asking if something is good enough. Instead, turn in your assignment proudly with a statement of fact, such as, here is my project, and it is great. <laughs>